Hello, my name is Helen McKnight, and I'm about to start my presentation on hospital pharmacies, inspection, response, and preparation. If you give me a second, I will share my screen. Okay, welcome again to Hospital Pharmacies Inspection, Preparation and Response. My name is Helen McKnight. I'm a pharmacist. I have a business degree and I'm very proud to say that I was the first person to become board certified in sterile compounding preparations as a pharmacist in the state of Alabama. A new test that was recently offered. I work at a medium-sized community hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. For this presentation, I have no conflicts of interest in regard to the presentation. The objectives are to review USP 797 pharmaceutical compounding, the sterile preparations compliance standards for hospital pharmacy, indicate the key stakeholders for the facility regulatory agency preparation team, identify the latest areas of regulatory agency enforcement in hospital pharmacies, and then outline an appropriate hospital pharmacy response to a regulatory agency inspection. I have four pre-assessment questions for you today. The first one is, USP 797 sterile preparation compliance standards for hospital pharmacy were last changed or revised on, is it July 1st, 2008, July 1st, 2019? Do you think it's December 1st, 2019? Or finally, it could be January 1st of 2020. The second pre-assessment question is, which facility position is most likely to play a significant role on the regulatory agency preparation team? Is it the chief financial officer, the compliance officer, pharmacy technician, or perhaps the volunteer president? Pre-assessment question three. What is the trend in regulatory agency accreditors action on compounding practices? Is it A, a slow trend downward, B, unchanged, C, a slow trend upward, or D, unpredictable? And finally, question four, what is the appropriate response to a regulatory agency inspection report? Is it A, no response, B, an informal letter, C, a corrective action report, or finally D, legal action? So we'll start by reviewing USP 797 pharmaceutical compliance, sterile preparation compliance standards for hospital pharmacy specifically. And we'll go over some definitions and get onto the same page so that we can follow up with what our preparation and response will be to a regulatory agency inspection. So there's at least nine different hospital pharmacy regulatory agencies that oversee various components of the pharmacy. It could be CMS, the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services, the State Department of Health, the State Board of Pharmacy, OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, also known as the FDA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or the DEA, the Joint Commission, which is now known as TJC, DNV is what some hospital facilities go with instead of the Joint Commission, 
And finally, AOA or the American Osteopathic Association. So let's talk about the United States Pharmacopeia or USP. It's a nonprofit organization that publishes a compendium of drug information in the combined volume. The combined volume is with the national formulary. The USP sets standards for dietary supplements, food ingredients, and even drugs, but it has no role in enforcing these standards. Enforcement is a responsibility of the FDA or other government agencies, whether that be on the state or local level. I've listed the mission and vision of USP, but I won't read it at this time. So does USP have legal recognition in the United States? Absolutely. The USP works closely with government agencies, ministries, even regulatory authorities around the world to provide standards for identity, strength, quality, and purity. They also have safeguard of global supply of medication, supplements, and food ingredients. Their standards are recognized both in the United States and 140 other countries. They have laboratories in South America, China, India, and the United States. What you should keep in mind is that the general chapters of USP are enforceable when they're numbered below the number 1000. So 797 or 800 would be enforceable. Keep in mind as you're reading the chapters, shall and must terms denote minimum required standards. You must comply with those. Should delineates recommendations of best practices, but it is not enforceable. Any chapter that's numbered greater than a thousand is informational only. There was an FDA final guidance document on outsourcing facilities that was released fairly recently, so I wanted to address that. There was some ambiguity around physical features and operations of outsourcing facilities. There are some health systems that have both an inpatient hospital pharmacy along with an outsourcing facility. And so the FDA attempted to clarify what the recommendations and features and operations of those facilities need to be. So an establishment compounding drug pursuant to patient specific prescriptions may be located near or in the same building as an outsourcing facility provided that they are completely separate. So there has to be boundaries between the two sections and those boundaries have to be clear and physical and permanent. So it would need to be walls or locked doors. They can't, the two operations cannot share rooms, equipment, supplies, or pass-through openings. Labeling has to clearly identify the compounder who produced the drug. And then all drug products compounded in the outsourcing facility are regulated under Section 503B and are subject to current good manufacturing practice requirements, even if the drug products are compounded pursuant to patient-specific prescriptions. We'll go over the definitions of what 503B are in just a second. Normally at this point, I'd start talking about the current USP guidelines, but there's been some changes over the last six months that I wanted to address. So on June 1st of 2019, the USP published revisions to chapters 795, 797, and created a new chapter 825. After publication of those, revit, of those standards, USB got appeals on certain provisions of 795, 797, and 825. Those appeals centered around beyond use dating, and the appeals committee started functioning in January of 2020. By the time they were finished with their review and assessment and recommendation, it was March. So in mid-March, the appeals committee noted 
that the appeal had been successful on beyond use dating and that the standard was sent back to committee. So if you look at the USP website, you will see an official letter posted as of May 1st, 2020, that notes that the appeals panel has granted the appeals for chapter 795 and 797. The chapters have been sent back to the compounding standards committee and the official text of USP 797 is the one that was last revised in July of 2008. So what is USP 797 involved? So the chapter objective is to describe conditions and practices to prevent harm, including death, to patients that could result from things such as microbial contamination, endotoxins, variability in the intended strength, unintended contaminants, and then ingredients of inappropriate quality in compounded sterile preparations. USP 800, on the other hand, had an objective to ensure the safe handling of hazardous drugs to minimize the risk of exposure to healthcare personnel, patients, and the environment. There were responsibilities of personnel handling hazardous drugs, facility and engineering controls, procedures for deactivating, decontaminating, and cleaning your facility, spill control, and then documentation. Those standards apply to all healthcare personnel who transport, receive, administer, or otherwise encounter hazardous drugs in an environment which they are handled. Um, but because USP 797-2019 reference, um, 800 and 800 reference 797, um, USP 800 at this time is merely informational. So let's talk about the definition of what drug compounding is. That is the process of combining, mixing, and altering ingredients to create medications tailored to the needs of an individual patient. So compounding involves combining two or more drugs. Compounded drugs are not FDA approved. The FDA doesn't verify their safety, effectiveness, or quality before they're marketed. Poor compounding practices can result in severe drug quality problems such as contamination or a drug that contains too much or too little inactive ingredient. What is the difference between 503A or 503B pharmacies? Well, 503A pharmacies focus on providing patient-specific compounded prescriptions. So in my pharmacy, we use a 503A compounding pharmacy to provide total parental nutrition for specific patients who are unable to, look, to obtain their nutrition via enteral means. We also use 503B pharmacies at my hospital, but that's to manufacture large batches with or without prescriptions to be sold to a healthcare facility such as mine for use in the office or use in that facility. So 503B pharmacies uh, provide me with presser drugs, drips, uh, anti-hypertensive medications, neuromuscular blockers, sedatives, and so on. They're not labeled for individual use. So if we continue to look at 503A versus 503B pharmacies, there are a couple of similarities and then several differences. So both 503A and 503B compounding pharmacies are allowed to compound drugs that are not FDA approved. They're also both able to, they are not subject to the requirement that the labeling bear adequate directions for use. But the difference in the two are highlighted below. The 503A is not subject to current good practice, uh, good, excuse me, current 
good manufacturing practices where the 503B compounding pharmacy is required to maintain current good manufacturing practices. The 503A compounding pharmacies under the jurisdiction of individual state boards of pharmacy, while the 503B is under the Food and Drug Administration jurisdiction. If we're looking at federal versus state oversight, the federal would be consistent nationwide, as you would expect, having that direct oversight of the 503B compounding facilities. There's a focus on their current good manufacturing practice requirements. You still have some registration requirements. And then there's very limited enforcement with non-pharmacy professional compounding. On the other hand, as you would expect, there's variation from state to state on what the governance is on compounding pharmacy. They do have, for the state boards of pharmacy, direct oversight for 503A professional compounding. There's a focus on USP 797 and 800. There continues to be licensing requirements, but again, there's limited enforcement with non-pharmacy professional compounding, such as prescriber compounding or mid-level practitioner compounding. So my pharmacy um, would more deal with 503A compounding facilities, and perhaps yours does too. We have compounding provided by licensed pharmacists in the state licensed pharmacy, or it could be a federal facility, or potentially by a licensed physician. Patient-specific compounding is occurring. Anticipatory compounding is permitted, but in limited quantities. We follow the requirements for bulk drug substances used to compound preparations. The regulation, again, is primarily conducted through the State Board of Pharmacy, but the FDA can regulate 503A compounders based on in sanitary condition provision of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. So for FDA jurisdiction, in most cases, there will be no jurisdiction of the FDA on 503A pharmacies, except anywhere where drug products are prepared, packaged, or held regarding in sanitary conditions, the FDA entry to all 503A pharmacies is accompanied, is often accompanied by a local board of pharmacy inspector. They're looking at operating conditions and reviewing and observing pharmacy compounding operations. If you're interested in learning more about insanitary conditions of compounding facilities, there is guidance that was put out in September of 2018. And this is a snapshot from the FDA website that would allow you to download the document and see further what those conditions would be. So we're all on the same page. We're looking at USP 797-2019. Compounded sterile preparation categorization was in three categories, low, medium, and high risk. Low risk conditions is compounding with aseptic manipulations using only sterile ingredients, products, and devices in an ISO class five or higher quality. It usually means manual mixing and measuring up to three manufactured products to create a compounded sterile preparation. So an example of that would be using sterile needles or syringes to transfer sterile liquids from an ampule or vial to a sterile device or package. For medium risk conditions that we would be compounding multiple doses of sterile products for administration to multiple patients, or it could be a single patient on multiple occasions, and the compounding process involves more than a single volume transfer or takes a long time. So an example of that could be compounded total parenteral nutrition. And then finally, high risk conditions would be use of non-sterile ingredients or non-sterile devices where you're exposing or you're exposing sterile ingredients or devices to air quality below ISA class five. There's prolonged storage of opened or partially used products that don't have a preservative in them. The 
labeling might be not there, all of those categorizations would be considered high risk. So if an example would be making a solution that will be terminally sterilized from non-sterile bulk drug powder. I'm not gonna go over this entire table, it's here for your reference, but I just wanted you to note some facility features that differed between low, medium, and high risk, and then compared them against the less than 12 hour beyond use state or hazardous drugs. So if we're looking at architecture, the pressure, the anteroom ISO or the buffer room ISO, specifically for low risk compounded sterile preparations, for example, the architecture could be plus or minus physically separated. The pressure in that room needs to be positive. The anteroom ISO could be, needs to be eight or seven if it's, there's an adjoining uh, hazardous buffer room. And then the buffer room ISO needs to be seven. Moving over here to the hazardous drug area, the architecture would be separated. The pressure would be negative as opposed to positive. The anteroom ISO would be ISO seven. And then the buffer room ISO would be ISO uh, seven as well. If you're more of a conceptual person, here is the facility requirements in a conceptual diagram. And so in the center where you would have the cleanest air, you would have the direct compounding area or DSA. The ISO class five primary engineering control, that would be your laminar flow hood. The buffer area or the room that that primary engineering control was contained within would be an ISO class seven. And then the ante room that adjoins there, the place where your sink would be, or the place where you garbed could be either ISO class eight or ISO class seven if it adjoins a hazardous drug room with negative pressure. So class, to make sure that everything is on the same page here, class is a clean room classification. Class is the level of cleanliness the room complies with according to the quantity and size of particles per volume of air. So an ISO one would be the very cleanest and then ISO nine would be the dirtiest. If you're familiar with the old federal standards 209 that was withdrawn back in 2001, a class 100,000 would be equivalent to an ISO class eight, 10,000 would be equivalent to an ISO class seven and then so forward. So the cleanest areas in your compounding facility would be those closest to the direct compounding area where you're compounding all of your sterile preparations. The risk level also affects the beyond use states. So we have low, medium, and high risk levels of compounded sterile preparations listed here on the left-hand side. Again, I'm not gonna read this entire table, but for refrigerated medications, if you're doing low risk compounding, then it would be 14 days, medium risk would be nine days, and then high risk, you would have a beyond use state of three days. So that brings us to key stakeholders or the facility, facility regulatory agency preparation team. And I have, a slide here that talks about the key stakeholders in your facility. So I really enjoyed um, the regulatory agency committee that my facility put together. And I'm going to focus first on this blue circle here where you have a compliance officer, a clinical staff members that could be nursing, physicians, respiratory therapists, and so forth, mid-level providers, human resources, which would be responsible for compliance with education, the engineering manager who ensured that your facility was, uh, had the right architecture for positive or negative pressure, the inspector of record, usually the engineering manager or the facilities director, 
and then construction director if you're doing some work in order to make your architecture appropriate for compounded sterile pre preparations. So all of these people would be key stakeholders that you would want to have on a team who were constantly monitoring to ensure that you were compliant with your regulatory standards. In addition to internal key stakeholders, there's also external key stakeholders. First and foremost, the patient, followed by providers, whether those be prescribers or mid-level practitioners, regulatory agencies, as we've already discussed, insurance or private payers, and then also the facilities, companies, healthcare systems, and so forth that are directly related to healthcare. Next, we're going to talk about the regulatory agency enforcement trends. And do, during my research for this presentation, I found the Government Accountability Office had done a drug compounding survey back in 2017. So just slightly dated, I've listed the background here on the slide for you. Keep in mind, uh, though the survey was published in 2017, it was actually administered and the data was pulled from February of 2016 through April of 2016. So about four years ago. The Government Accountability Office surveyed the state pharmacy regulatory bodies in all 50 states District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and all but four completed the survey. So this slide shows the state pharmacy regulatory bodies with primary responsibility for drug compounding oversight. So in terms of the drug compounder type, whether that be pharmacy or pharmacist, FDA registered 503B facilities, those are those outsourcing facilities, uh, physicians or healthcare practitioners, nurse practitioners or physician's assistant. Respondents to the survey said yes, they were had the state pharmacy regulatory body oversight, mainly 100% for the pharmacy and the pharmacist and then 70% for the FDA registered 503B facility. In the meantime, physicians and mid-level prescribers said no, there was no regulatory oversight for them from a state board of pharmacy level. The Government Accountability Office also found which states that reported conducting joint pharmacy inspections with the Food and Drug Administration. The graph shows the percentage of states that the study had conducting joint pharmacy inspections with the FDA inspectors. The majority, 39 states, 78% do conduct dual inspections. 10 states or 20% do not conduct joint inspections and 2% did not respond. Well, why are there some reasons the state board reported not conducting joint inspections with the FDA? One reason was they weren't asked. Second was a staffing issue. There was not enough inspector positions. And then finally, some states recorded conducting inspections separately and then sharing certain information with the Food and Drug Administration. The Pharmacy Purchasing and Products Magazine put a survey out to their readers in April of 2020, and they called that the State of Pharmacy Compounding Survey, and I pulled a few slides from that survey. This is trends in outsourcing due to drug shortages. You can see here that the graph goes from 2014 to 2020. 55% of facilities were outsourcing 
to compounding pharmacies due to drug shortages in 2014. And that trend gradually went down until it reached the NADAR in 2017. But in 2018, as we hit the opiate shortage, it jumped back up to 50%. In 2019, we had an electrolyte shortage with sodium bicarb 8.4% and dextrose 50% jumped up to 52%. The opiate crisis continued. And now so far in 2014, is showing 41% on a slight downward trend um, for facilities that are outsourcing due to drug shortages. This slide is inspecting for USP 797 compliance. Who is inspecting? The key shows that the pink line was accreditors, crediting agencies. The blue line is the state board. And then the purple line is CMS, or the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare Services. So the majority, or 75%, were either accrediting agencies or state boards, with CMS lagging behind at 31% being um, inspecting for USP 797 compliance. And this is from the years of 2012 through 2020. So what happens when accreditors act on compounding practices? This slide is a trend from 2010 through 2020, so 10 years. And the orange line is the recommendations that the accreditors made based on non-compliance. And then the blue line is citations that accreditors acted on based on compounding practices. So you can see with the orange line where they made recommendation way back in 2010, about 6% of the time, where now in 2020, it's about 14%. So we're seeing a slow trend upwards for recommendations being made. Likewise, for citations back in 2010, only 1% of folks notice that there were accreditors actions resulting in citations. But again, we're seeing a slow trend up to 8% of respondents now said that they were being cited in 2020 for their compounding practices. This slide details the frequency of recurring inspections by the number of states that reported conducting them again from the Government Accountability Office. Two states reported conducting reoccurring inspections and did not report the frequency of these inspections. 12 states reported having a separate pharmacist license category for inpatient compounding pharmacies. And 12 states reported having a category for out-of-state sterile compounding pharmacies. Some states reported that they inspected pharmacies they know are compounding sterile drugs, even if their state does not have a license category for these entities. So let me orient you to this bar graph. Along the bottom here is the key, and this is how often the state agency is inspecting the licensed entity, such as the pharmacy. And then here it shows the different pharmacies. So inpatient pharmacy, outpatient pharmacy, and so forth you will see that based on this orange line being the highest for inpatient pharmacy, they most frequently were inspected every one to two years. For outpatient pharmacy, they were inspected every one to two years. If you're in state sterile compounding pharmacy, then the majority of time you were being inspected less than one year or around the six month mark. Out of state sterile compounding pharmacies had a slight trend up towards being inspected every one to two years. In state uh, um, outsourcing facilities were, were closely between less than one year and one to two years. And then finally out of state uh, outsourcing facilities were between um, less than one year and one to two years. 
So you can expect your regulatory agency to come somewhere between one and two years. Uh, so you want to be sure that you are ready. Of course, we don't have data from the regulatory agencies and we're not sure exactly what they're enforcing. Um, but the folks that responded back to the state of pharmacy compounding survey in April 2020 said the trends that they noticed were on hand hygiene and appropriate hand washing, first air mixing in the laminar flow hood, that means blocking first air so that uh, the, the device or the vial is not bathed in, in a unilateral directional air. And then also enforcement trends on documentation and follow-up after they were cited or had recommendations made. The State of Pharmacy Compounding Survey also asked respondents if they knew if an on-site visit had been conducted. 65% of respondents said that they did not know if an on-site visit had been conducted. This pie graph in the middle has outsourced vendor being inspected by the FDA and whether or not the respondents knew if their outsourced vendor had been inspected. 52% said yes, and that's wonderful that they knew that, but 45% of folks didn't know if their outsourced vendor had been inspected by the FDA. Outsourced vendor inspected by the State Board of Pharmacy 62% of respondents did not know whether or not the outsourced vendor that they were using for their facility had been inspected by the state board. 28% said yes. This slide shows the FDA form 483 actions and what respondents thought of that. So as a reminder to you, the FDA form 483 is an inspectional observational form which is used by the agency to document and communicate their concerns that they discovered during inspection. So respondents 49% of the time didn't knew if a 483 had been issued to the outsourcing vendor that they would using, but 42% did not know. Interestingly, 100% were satisfied by the vendor's corrective actions. So for the folks that did know if a 403 form had been put posted online, they were satisfied with what the vendor did in order to correct those deficits. So how do we prepare in hospital pharmacy for our inspection. That's what the next 20 minutes or so are going to be about. The first thing I would certainly urge each of you that are leaders in your facility is to read the applicable regulatory chapters. I've listed some logos for NIOSH and the FDA and OSHA and USP. You wanna maintain knowledge of all applicable pharmacy laws and regulations a preparation by a 503B pharmacy for a potential FDA inspection has to, has to have a complete understanding of how an FDA inspector actually evaluates a compounding pharmacy. Again, there's that guidance that was issued about the insanitary conditions, and you can find that, and I've put that into the notes section if you'd like to refer to that. Another extremely val valuable resource is a free newsletter produced by a consultant that do documents and evaluates each and every FDA Form 483 that's issued to any 503A or B facility. The newsletter actually analyzes and discusses each observation that the FDA inspector identifies for a particular pharmacy, thus providing the reader with deeper understanding of what the FDA expectations actually are. The newsletter is free. You can sign up for it via link. I will have the link in the notes section of the slides 
After signing up, you receive a new newsletter each time it's published and it comes via email. Once you're familiar with the actual FDA inspection process and the FDA expectations, you want to have a thorough assessment of your pharmacy, including the business's physical operations, the infrastructure, policies and procedures, training, quality management. Remember, the FDA does not use USP guidance as a reference. The FDA, if you've been inspected by the FDA, uses current good manufacturing practices as a gold standard. So you wanna become conversant in the current good manufacturing practices and it's critically important to understand that those are different than USP 797. You can stay informed. So you can attend or review minutes from regulatory agencies or your state board of pharmacy meetings. Those meetings routinely include hot topics, discussions for enforcement of focused initiatives. Stay abreast of new developments through professional associations, continuing education, or seminars such as this one. Ensure that you have established policies and procedures. For example, the FDA investigations operations manual says photographs are one of the most effective and useful forms of evidence. But what is your policy on photography and cameras in your pharmacy department? For me, my policy is that no cameras are allowed in the pharmacy department and no photos can be taken in the pharmacy department. So if that's your policy, you want to have that updated and a sign should be posted in the central pharmacy stating so. You identify one employee, usually the pharmacist in charge, or if you've already implemented USP 800, you might have a designated individual to field questions from the inspector. The key employee has to understand the limitations of the breadth and the scope of inspection authority and they need to be familiar with all your policies and procedures. I'm putting in a plug for pharmacy because pharmacists play an essential role in both 503A and 503B facilities. Pharmacists in 503B facilities can supervise proper documentation and manufacturing of large compounded orders. 503A pharmacists might have more hands-on involvement in tailoring preparations to patient specific needs. Regardless if you're a 503A or B pharmacy, you have to comply with state and federal regulations and complete third-party testing for your preparation for the law. You have to comply with environmental monitoring, hazardous drug handling standards, and employee training. You can take a leading role in your facility team. The facility team has regular monthly meetings. They will review standards. They will talk about educating employees and various departments. And also sometimes they do mock surveys the more of a leading role that you take with a facility team, the more comfortable you will be if a regulatory agency comes through your department. Ensure minimum standard compliance. So you wanna make sure the pharmacy and your facility is clean, the drug refrigerator and other equipment, such as your laminar flow hoods are fully operational, any expired, recall, damaged, altered drugs, all of those have been quarantined, removed from active inventory and destroyed. During my research for this presentation, I found something that I didn't know about, which was the multi-state pharmacy inspection checklist. And I've put on this slide that you would want to review that checklist. So the National Associations of Boards of Pharmacy or NABP worked with the state boards of pharmacy to establish this blueprint program. 18 states have agreed to the following five requirements. They have a universal inspection form. They have a 
universal inspection form or a crosswalk version of the form. Their compliance officers have gone through initial training and that initial training has to meet NABP criteria. They also have to undergo ongoing training, which is offered on an annual basis via the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. And that's a webinar that's provided at no cost to the states. The states that agree to this multi-state pharmacy inspection checklist have to attest that they will inspect their pharmacies no less than once every 18 months. And then the final, the final requirement is that inspection report sharing is done through NAPP eProfile Connect. So if you're one of those 18 states, certainly looking at the checklist ahead of time and ensuring that you are compliant with every component of the checklist is helpful. Even if you're not one of those 18 states, looking at the inspection checklist that's available can help you to be ready in your pharmacy. So you want to prepare your team. So prepare the staff with mock interviews. You can have staff meetings, didactic training. I chose to hang diagrams in key areas. For example, there's a number of steps for hand washing and it's hard to remember all of those different state steps. So I had one of my staff pharmacists make up a diagram in order to ensure that each person did it exactly the same way. Cleaning practices, beyond use dating, certification reports, all of these make great diagrams that can be hung in a clean manner near or close to your compounding area. Review inspection policies and procedures. Employees should understand that they are no under they are under no obligation to respond to questions asked that they should not talk to the inspectors unless they're specifically asked to by the key employee and they should be coached on how to respond. Create the pharmacy inspection binder is the next tip that I have for you. You can organize all your records into an inspection binder and ensure that the pharmacy is not missing any important documents. An electronic binder is preferred. I have a paper version. That's also acceptable. The organization will show the inspector that the pharmacy is vigilant. They will respect that you are demonstrating compliance with pharmacy laws. It eliminates sloppy record keeping or in missing documents because you have tabs for everything. Uh, if there was sloppy documents, it would be viewed as an intentional disregard for pharmacy law compliance. So if the staff is not, excuse me, if the staff should be trained how to access the inspection binder in case of the key designated employee that we talked about earlier is not available. If the inspector asks to make a copy of the binder, be sure that you make a copy for yourself and always keep duplicate sets of copies for the pharmacy records. This is what my binder has. It has certification reports, facility diagrams, environmental sa sampling tests, air sampling tests, beyond use dating, any cleaning practices or policies, as well as competence compliance for my staff members. And then there's tabs that are indicating which section that you're in in the binder. You wanna establish an inspection protocol. So during the inspector, Inspection, you require the inspector to show their credentials. Don't permit the inspector to have free access to your records, documents, or files. Establish a room or an area where the inspector can meet with staff and review documents or even ask questions. You want to designate a staff member other than the key employee to take notes during the inspection process. Any questions that were asked, any statements that were made, any comments made by the inspector or the pharmacist in charge. Instruct the staff, again, to respond truthfully only to questions asked. Don't volunteer information not asked. Your staff should be polite and respectful. 
you want to prohibit your staff members from admitting any violations of laws or regulations. You can ask questions about the audit scope and the goals. You can provide copies of any requested documents, but make sure you keep the originals and document any records provided. If the investigator collects samples, take a duplicate batch sample for yourself and ensure that you have a receipt that's called an FDA form 484. Summarize what was said during an exit meeting to determine any issues identified and ask for a discrepancy list in writing. Make no comments regarding the follow-up action. Do not reject observations. Don't become defensive. Don't make commitments that you're not going to be able to fulfill later on. Don't sign any documents that acknowledge any specific findings or commit to any corrective actions prior to consulting with your facility legal counsel. The FDA has no authority to compel the pharmacy to sign anything. The best approach is to have the pharmacy officials refuse to sign or give an oral confirmation that the statement is correct. If you're forced to sign, be sure that you get a copy of your signed document. Document all communication. So when you're dealing with the FDA and you have a form 483 that has said that you have corrective issues, each observation will be separately numbered. In your response, you wanna address each point. You give a detailed explanation of how the pharmacy will modify its content, conduct, what changes will be made and what new procedures are in place. You can give a target date of when you expect those corrective actions to be implemented. If you disagree with the findings, be respectful with your response. Perhaps you are a 503A a compounding facility. You didn't expect the FDA to show up. They were there with the State Board of Pharmacy. You don't think that you should be cited based on any FDA findings. You could make a statement such as, to the extent the observations cited in the Form 483 are based on current good manufacturing practices for finished pharmaceuticals, such observations are inapplicable to the operations of a health system pharmacy. The pharmacy operates in compliance with the requirements of the US government, applicable state laws, and regulations governing pharmacy. And if you don't remember all of that, I'll have it in the notes page available to you. So in the last five or six minutes, we're going to finish up with our inspection response for hospital pharmacy. Here's some common inspection deficits for compounding pharmacy. You could have a facility and equipment standard issue, master formulation record requirement deficiency, a discrepancy in beyond use state assignments based on risk categorization, sterile compounding quality assurance not being followed appropriately, process validation having a deficiency, and finally failure to maintain appropriate books and records. So the inspection report can range the gamut. You could have a warning notice, a written corrective order, a citation, or even criminal charges levied against the pharmacy. These are forwarded to the appropriate regulatory agencies and they can be used to determine possible disciplinary action. So let's talk about the warning notice. This is used for minor violations. You could have a follow-up visit required and the violations have to be corrected. A pharmacy reply to a warning letter would need to be written and do four things. One is to acknowledge receipt of the letter. Two is to implement or review implemented responses to the minor violation. Three is to note that the FDA should publish this letter on its website. So the letter which shows that you have corrected that minor violation would be published in addition to the 483 that has been posted. And the FDA would disclose the response in addition to the violation. And finally, four, your reply should suggest that the pharmacy is exempt from the current good manufacturing practices based on state and US law. 
for written order of correction, these are more serious violations. They're not necessitating disciplinary action. You want to submit and implement a written corrective action plan. And again, the compliance needs to be documented. Second, you would have the corrective action plan, which would again have those four requirements, acknowledgement of the receipt of the letter, reviewing your implemented response, noting that your corrective action plan would be posted along with the violation, and finally suggesting if it's in the case of the FDA, that your pharmacy might be exempt from current good manufacturing practices. Disciplinary action is more serious. Those are findings that warrant disciplinary actions. You could be referred to local, state, or federal prosecutions for filing of criminal charges and then possible sanctions, which are go anywhere from citations to suspensions to probation and monitoring to continuing education that's mandatory. And then certainly those reports could be sent with reciprocity from state to state. If you wanted to get involved and you want to know more about the FDA and the comments that could potentially be made against you or your facility, you can go to their website. There are instructions on how to submit comments regarding specific drafts or final policy documents. And I've listed the website for you in the Federal Register notice that you would go to. There's also a public doc get to receive information, recommendations, and comments on matters related to the FDA's regulation of compounding of human drug products under sections 503A or B, and you can put your comments into the public docket. So in the last few minutes, we're going over our post-assessment questions. The USP 797 sterile preparation compliance standards for hospital pharmacy were last changed or revised on July 1st, 2008. The documents that were produced in 2019 are currently under appeal and they are not the official document that is being used by regulatory agencies at this time. Which facility position is most likely to play a significant role on the regulatory agency preparation team? That would be the compliance or risk officer who oftentimes is running those meetings. If you are a pharmacy leader or a healthcare leader, you can certainly be part of that committee. What is the trend in regulatory agency accreditors action on compounding practices? That is a slow trend upward as we demonstrated from 2010 through 2020. And finally, what is the appropriate response to a regulatory agency inspection report? That is the corrective action report that you would want to have written and sent back to the regulatory agency and ensure that it's posted with any violations that you might have occurred, incurred. During the first six months of 2020, we've been in an unusually challenging situation. I would note that the Joint Commission, one of the regulatory agencies, has already announced as of the end of May that they will resume hospital inspections after a pandemic hiatus. You want to be ready for any regulatory agency in your, in your realm to come through your facility. I thank you for your attention and I open the floor for questions. I appreciate you listening intensely to this presentation, and I look forward to networking with you throughout the conference.